Welcome to our Saturday simulcast following Purdue's 44 to 7 bucket victory over Indiana. Lots to talk about tonight, not only about today, but also what may be down the road for the Boilermakers. I want to thank our sponsor, the Purdue Union Club uh, Hotel, and uh, also the 811 Restaurant. We appreciate both of them and their sponsorship of this uh, Saturday simulcast. And Tom, I'm going to start with you, um, 44 to 7. There may have actually been some style points in the second half and the fact that Purdue kind of gathered itself from a slow start and really took care of business. Uh, it wasn't a perfect performance, but the four touchdowns uh, in the second half and the ability or the, uh, to really create some distance between the Boilermakers and the Hoosiers had to be a uh, somewhat satisfying for the Purdue faithful after that uh, victory. Yeah, they did do what they were supposed to do, right? Um, I think a lot of people thought they were supposed to win this game convincingly. Uh, everybody knew about the red flag when you're playing your rival rule. When you're playing your rival and all, all that, uh, throw the records out the books, all that uh, blah, blah, blah. And Purdue, uh, again, took care of business in a very impressive uh, fashion, 44-7, to seven, guys. That opening drive for IU, engineered that, and they got a TD after that, you know, obviously nothing. So credit the defense for making adjustments right away. That I will say this, though, guys, not to get off on a tangent, but that last drive of the first half by IU was one of the most bizarre drives uh, I can recall. Uh, Purdue uh, did all it could to keep that drive alive, and it was it was very strange. But nonetheless, again, the offense showed some balance, guys. Purdue ran for 167 yards today. Just the third 100-yard rushing effort of the season by the team. Brian and I were sitting shoulder to shoulder marveling at the run game. The longest run in Big Ten play by the Boilermakers occurred today. Thank you, King Daru. And they did it. Dylan Downings, <laughs> Downings is the longest rush of the year. Yeah, 33-yard yeah, run uh, he scored on it. And, of course, Daru had a 31-yarder earlier. So, yeah, it was nice to see the ground game go. And Aiden O'Connell, you know, we could have a whole podcast about Aiden O'Connell, right? Uh, 200 and I believe 20 two passes in a row without an interception. Alan, I think I was listening to the radio broadcast. You, you were quoted there as saying it's the first time a Purdue quarterback has gone four games in a row without an interception. Is that right? And that now is at five, at least dating back to 2000. And uh, I think it's it's probably as long as any Purdue quarterback has. The thing we can't quite figure out is the consecutive pass. It also is a record for Purdue, even though the NCAA record's 440, if you can believe that. So no, a long way to go. Aiden O'Connell, Brian, it's hard to put into terms. I mean, this guy not only has he shown up uh, for Purdue, but all of a sudden you start to look at him and say, well, is he a guy that can come back? and Or is he a guy that plays at the next level? I mean, I don't know what, what you'd rule out with him. He's, he's just been unbelievably consistent uh, down the stretch and has made uh, Purdue's offense go from a 13-point scoring machine to a pretty much a scoring machine. Yeah, that that's that, that's the difference in Purdue. Uh, the back half of the season is they got that high level quarterback play that the program has always needed when it's been good, regardless who the coach is, regardless who the quarterback is. When the quarterback is really good, you know that's when Purdue has a chance to be good. And I think that clicked with Aiden O'Connell uh, kind of after that Wisconsin game when he threw too many picks. Uh, mm -hmm. Ever since then, he's been damn near flawless. I mean, the throws he was making today, that guy was was throwing footballs through a tire from 50 yards out. I mean, he was it was just one of the best quarterback performances I think I've probably seen. Uh, to your point earlier about Purdue doing what it was supposed to do, I, you know, I, I think that a lot of people wanted Purdue to blow the hell out of Indiana here. I don't know if that was necessarily the, 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 the most likely a scenario. I mean, if Purdue had won this game 28 to 14, I think everybody would have been perfectly cool with that. Um, but this was a situation where Purdue just turned it on at halftime after they were kind of lackadaisical or whatever term you want to use in the first half, a little bit rough around the edges uh, and still completely controlled the game for the most part. Um, but the biggest part of that was just – the biggest part of the whole game was just Aiden O'Connell was just, you know, playing at a really, really high level for Purdue. And if you get him back next year and you run this same offense the same way you ran this offense – over the final five, six games of the season, you're right back here a year from now with seven or eight wins, and all of a sudden you're talking about sustained success. You buy some time for Michael Lamo or Brady Allen, whoever it might be, to take the reins the year after. 
to your point about Aiden O'Connell, I don't know if he's an NFL athlete. He's got an NFL arm. I don't think that was ever really a question, but you know, the next level is drafting the whole package, not just the arm. Um, but I think you can make a real pragmatic case here that Aiden O'Connell being a bona fide adult at this point in his life, the athletic benefits he'd get from coming back for another year wouldn't be as significant as what he might benefit, the benefits he might draw from coming back and being a starting quarterback from day one until the very end of the season, you know, learning even more from the Brahms and, and whatever else, showing more of of what he can do. He's going to have good receivers still next year. Even if David Bell goes pro, he's going to have a chance to have like a, like a 4,500 yard passing season next year. That might be a little overstatement, but um, he could really put himself in an all big 10 sort of maybe even borderline nationally prominent sort of strata. If he comes back next year and that could, could help him get that opportunity at the next level. Maybe he's looking for, maybe he's not, I don't know. Yeah, I, I I don't know the answer to that. I mean, he's got age, though. I know we know he's going to this would be a six year back in college. But again, these are things he never probably thought about three, three years ago. And now uh, all of a sudden that topic of conversation is got to be in his wheelhouse of what what will be next. But there is no question, Tom, and not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but 2022, if you just look at that schedule. Uh, you have Penn State to open the season, but you've got your crossover games are Indiana, Maryland and Penn State. Think about that. And then your other two non-conference games are Florida Atlantic and Indiana State uh, and the other one, Syracuse. I mean, you've got a chance to win a lot of games early on. And uh, that all is going to tie in. I guess in, in tying into looking ahead and a bowl game, which we won't know until next Sunday, and there's a lot of conjecture of where this is all going to come out, and it probably won't be clear until we see what happens with Michigan and Iowa. Uh, there's a lot to be, you know, to, to ferret through with that and whether, you know, people say, well, Purdue could be at the Outback Bowl. I still think we kind of talked among, among our group that it seems to me looking at it logically a little bit of a long shot. But um, yeah, and I know Brian has an opinion on this, but uh, looking ahead, this is still the fact that you've got three or four weeks to get better and play another game uh, has to be a real plum in, in the for this football program, Tom. Yeah, I mean they needed uh, they needed this season, guys. I mean, 2019 four and eight, 2020 two and four. I mean, you guys lived it too, and uh, they needed to get things back on track. And I think back in August, most of us were pressed to give predictions on what the record was going to be for Purdue. I think six wins. We would have said maybe seven. Things really go well. Well, here we are, guys. Eight wins, the first time since 2006. So yeah. Uh, Jeff Bromsdorf has restored the hope that he fueled when he got to West Lafayette. No question. 2017 with those back-to-back bowl bids. Uh, and again, it, it, it was much needed, let's just say that. And I think Jeff Brom understood that. And he talked about, you know, just the importance of, uh, of, of what winning the bucket means, too, to the program in the post game as well. So uh, um, this is something they can tangibly sell and show to people, show to recruits. You got to think, guys, it's going to be easier selling season tickets next year for sure, right? They had some great crowds this year, and the anticipation for next year ought to be great. We talked about the schedule, Al, and they open with Penn State at home, and that's going to be a very interesting season opener. So, yeah, it looks like it's very manageable as well. So, And, yeah, we'll, we'll have to, uh, to sort through the roster here in these coming months. Yeah, it's going to be a story. There'll be a lot of churn. Yeah, there'll be a lot of churn, right, with the, with the portal, who's going to leave. Uh, who's staying, um, but Brian and I talked a little bit in the press box, you know, uh, offensively, boy, there's going to be a lot of good talent coming back. And if Connell, if O'Connell does come, boy, what a cherry on top he would be. And defensively too, uh, I think you're going to see, because you have a chance to, the chance to have a pretty good uh, defense again. So again, what's going to happen with the coaching staff too, right? Has Jeff Brom ever not had change on his coaching staff since he's been here in any off season? So that seems to be a constant, too. Well, that can change. That's another dynamic. So, um, But still, uh, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, this has been a fun year, a year I didn't expect it to end up like this, guys. And, Alan, to, to think we're talking about the possibility of playing on January 1st, uh, it's just remarkable. I never thought we'd even be, even be discussing the Outback Bowl. But, again, um, just a great season for the program. Like I said earlier, a much-needed season for the program. 
Yeah, I think Purdue would be a team that would, doesn't have bowl fatigue. It would have been three years now. I understand not many teams went to bowls in 2020, and I get all that. But uh, uh, that part is that part is a storyline. Brian, we talked earlier, too, about the, you know just what you want, how you want to end your season. David Bell, George Karloftis will have a decisions to make on whether they play in the bowl game. That's a very common trend. And no, nobody here is going to think any less of them if they choose not to because they have professional careers ahead of them. Uh, you would think that you know, you'd said earlier that, you know, that David Bell at least has shown that he's willing to play. He could have, David Bell could have folded the 10 after the Notre Dame game this year yeah. too, after that, no, clearly that, but the importance of that, not necessarily winning that bowl game, but playing in a bowl game that you can be competitive in uh, and ending the season on a, a still trending in the right way. That's uh, Brian, I think is an important thing. Yeah. Uh, just to, to circle back to that, to that last topic, because I get, I get paid by the minute of talking here yeah. um, <laughs> is that I think what this season's success did was I think it probably could have put a lot of people's mind at ease that the, the struggles of the last two seasons were circumstantial. I think, mm-hmm. you know, the injuries they had a couple of years ago were biblical in proportion. And I think yeah. last year between the, the COVID pandemic and the Bob Diaco epidemic, <laughs> I think, you know, <laughs> that probably had a lot of things to do with it. But I think this season stabilized the program, kind of validated things that all was not lost uh, when everything went sideways those last two years. But to your point about the bowl game, I think personally, look, nowadays all the money is the same anyway. If all, the same number of Big Ten teams go to bowl games, you're sharing it anyway. Mm-hmm. doesn't really matter financially what bowl game you really go to uh, all that much. I say at this stage of your program building uh, endeavor, I say uh, – you want somebody you can beat. I think the last thing you want to have happen is to go down to Florida and or wherever, run into somebody from the SEC who's just got unbelievable athleticism or whatever it might be. You might not have David Bell and George Karloff, this, whatever it might be. You don't want the Music City Bowl to happen again. Uh, I'm not saying that a middle-of-the-pack SEC team is assuredly going to beat Purdue as bad as Purdue got beat by Auburn a couple years ago. But that's where everything kind of went to hell for Purdue uh, afterwards. Now, I just mentioned all the circumstances involved in that. So the causation there might not be there. But I think it would be a a really healthy thing for Purdue to win that bowl game or at least be very, very competitive in that bowl game with somebody. If you got an Arizona again, you know, somebody like that, that would be not. I understand Arizona is not on the table. um, But if you got somebody of of that. Arizona State is. And then, yeah, somebody that's beatable, yeah. I think that would be I think that would be your best outcome here. Again, I know it matters to people. Oh, we played in this bowl game, which is better than this bowl game. But that stuff's just cosmetic. That stuff's eye candy. Um, mm-hmm. The money doesn't matter anymore. I say get a win. Yeah. Now, one thing that does matter for Kevin Warren, I, he's going to be wearing maize and blue to Indianapolis because Michigan needs – it makes a big difference in terms of how much money gets shared around the Big Ten that Michigan makes the college football playoff. And they're the only team in the Big Ten that has a chance of doing so. Uh, and obviously the Wolverines would have to beat Iowa. Now, the Michigan looked – I don't know how much of the game you guys saw today. saw enough to say – Michigan really, really played well from that standpoint. So it's going to, that'll be an interesting thing. All right. Yeah. But Tom, you'll, you know, this will be an interesting off season. You're going to have bowl practices. You're going to have, yeah. we know there'll be a transfer portal issue because every team's going to have some of that. Uh, you're going to have a great storyline of who in senior day is going to come back. Uh, that will be interesting as well. Uh, you know, all these factors come into play and it uh, is going to make for, and it gets back to this relevance thing that I know Brian's been always harped on, and he's right. Purdue football has sold out its last three games, and that is an impressive number. And if there's anything that's a that's a validation of Jeff Brom and company, and I understand it could have been some of it has to do with, uh, you know, the fact that nobody went to any games last year, but the fact that you sold out your last three – and all of a sudden, you've got people clamoring. Selling out the bucket game is not easy after Thanksgiving. It hasn't happened all that many times. And this is that's an impressive thing that Purdue is selling tickets. It is creating interest. And as Brian said, or you know, this program's got uh, there's faith in the coaching staff mm-hmm. once again. And uh, that's all a good place to be, I would think, Tom. Yeah, you know, they, they figured it out, guys. And that's what coaches are paid to do. They're you got you to be a problem solver when things aren't working. Everybody does at their job, right? 
And that's exactly what Jeff Rom did with this offense, guys. It wasn't working. We all knew it. And uh, he tried things, right? Tried to manufacture a ground game with three quarterbacks and ultimately switch quarterbacks going from Plummer to O'Connell. And, you know, this tinkering, putting Jackson Anthrop in the backfield, you know, and, and he found solutions, right? And, and if the offense finally carried its weight to complement that defense that played well all year, right? So, uh, yeah, give them a lot of credit on, on that front. And, uh, yeah, senior day, Alan, you mentioned that. You know, Brian and I were watching that. Um, Obviously, Carl Loftus and Bell aren't coming back, right? And they were in senior day, right? I'm so senior. they went through it. <laughs> we noticed three other guys that didn't take part in senior day. Mitchell Fenron, who was a grad transfer this year from Sanford, was not part of it. Uh, DJ Washington, who a, was a fifth-year senior, I believe, this year, wasn't part of it. And Chris Jefferson, a true senior from Finley College, who transferred. So for whatever that's worth, Keep that on your radar. We know Mitchell Finneran at one point expressed that he would like to come back during the Jeff Rom radio show about a month or so ago. So, yeah, a lot of moving parts still. Uh, what other guys are going to want to come back? Uh, you know, who's going to leave? Guys going to jump in the portal. We know that. Who's Purdue going to fish out of the portal? And on and on it goes. So it's always going to be a fun offseason. Signing day, guys, December 15th, I believe. Uh, we all know Purdue's got, I think, 18 commitments right now. Jeff Brom talked about the postseason, guys. Uh, you know, Brian, you were there. I think he's going to give the team two weeks off, he said. They're going to hit the road recruiting tomorrow is what Jeff Brom said as well. They're still, they're still looking for guys. I don't know if that surprised you or not, Brian, but it did me a little bit. I think Nothing kind of, ever surprises me anymore with recruiting. <laughs> yeah. Seems like they got 150 scholarships to give. but It seems like every school in the country is signing 20 guys with eight open scholarships, so whatever. I stopped <laughs> asking the question. It's, yeah. Right, the bowl. Of course, Jerry Palm sat sat right by right by Brian, and uh, of course we kibitzed. Jerry likes to talk. <laughs> yeah, we kibitzed about bowl possibilities. Of course, Jerry's a guru, one of the best. We all love Jerry, and you know, guys, still Vegas Bowl, Guarantee Rate Bowl, Penn Stripe Bowl. Jerry thought maybe the Penn Stripe Bowl would be off the table because Purdue already played in a baseball, an iconic baseball stadium this year. I don't know if that's true or not. He says there's a rule where you can't go back to a bowl within like a four or five year period, which would next yeah, city bowl. Yeah. So, uh, who knows? But it still seems like you're looking at probably Phoenix or Vegas, maybe New York. If I was a betting man, those would be the destinations I think probably most likely to land. But like you said, Alan, there's still a lot of moving parts here that, that could really impact that. Yeah. In, in Vegas, you play the Pac-12. In yeah. Phoenix, you pay the big – uh, Big 12, and of course, in New York, it would be the ACC. So, as your opponent, uh, and of course, it's crazy year because Illinois at five and seven, they may not fill their quotient. It's, it's bizarre how many, and they have a high enough APR, they may end up in a bowl game, believe it or not. So, you know, maybe, maybe. Illinois would five games. I know, and, and they kicked the kicked the heck out of Northwestern today. So, oh, did they? Yeah, badly. Got to go somewhere. They're seven and five. So how, I, I haven't gone that, looked up how many count up how many Big Ten teams are bowl eligible, but probably nine or ten, huh? Right. Well, you've got uh, outside of Purdue, you got Maryland that got its way, but Rutgers also has a high enough APR, even though they're five and seven, that they could they could get to a bowl game too. So yeah, you got it's going to be interesting to see, and and uh, that is something we're going to watch very closely from that standpoint. Uh, Brian, I wanted to ask, and it's crazy when you have a team that's ranked third in the country. That it's an also ran. This will be discussion points as we do these Saturday simulcasts uh, throughout the winter. Obviously, some talk about Gonzaga, Gonzaga losing last night to Duke. Not that it matters, but uh, it would be Purdue has never been number one in in, in the polls in basketball. Uh, it's possible that could happen. I think maybe Duke will leapfrog and do that. But your point, Brian, is that uh, this is a schedule. Purdue's got some teams. Uh, it could it keeps its nose the grindstone can win a lot of games going a lot of consecutive games to open up this season based on what we've seen today yeah i don't i mean i don't know if purdue's going to move up to number one i my personal guess is they'll be number two uh behind i would Duke. agree i would agree um, too but the thing you have going for you here is if you keep playing the way you've been playing you know i think you're you're you never want to speak too soon because as soon as you say something, <laughs> something happens. But, you know, Purdue, I think it's home free in non-conference. I think Florida State 
you know, you never take them lightly, but having them in Mackey, I don't know if this is a necessarily a, uh, typical Florida state team. I don't know if they have any pros like they normally do. I don't, I think the Florida state teams that have really given Purdue problems. I think Purdue has either been soft or had issues gelling at the time Purdue played those guys. They weren't quite ready for prime time, so to speak. I think this Purdue team is very different. Um, NC State on a neutral site. Obviously, that's a high major opponent. I don't know how good NC State is. Butler in the crossroads. You never say never about the crossroads, especially, but I, I can't imagine, you know, Purdue losing that game. You're sitting here looking at your first two Big Ten games. Iowa, you might score. If Iowa defends the way Iowa traditionally defends, Purdue might score 120 points. Rutgers is, is not what Rutgers has been uh, over the years. You never take the rack lightly either, but you're sitting here. Well, my point is you have an opportunity here to string together wins. And if you do that, and if Duke does jump over you, maybe somebody gets Duke at some point, um, you know, yeah. and then somebody will get Duke, yeah. and then your time comes, you might just have to kind of wait it out a little bit, but the most important thing is Purdue keep playing the way Purdue's playing, obviously. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see. So, all right. A lot of fun things to talk about. A lot of conjecture. Uh, that's something we try to do it's the fun part of the job to figure out what I think we're going to have an interesting next few weeks, even with the start of the start of uh, uh, yeah. practice, but that yeah, Tom, last, go ahead. Last time, tell us again, last time, Purdue was number two in the country. Yeah. Nine, well, 1988. Right. Um, and I don't think they got to, they got to number three with Glenn Robinson and they got to number three, which I screwed that up uh, twice. They were under, under Matt Painter with the, the, the difficult loss of Rob Hummel up at Minnesota. Purdue was ranked third. And then, of course, a couple of years ago, three years ago, I guess it was. And I totally had spaced that. The, Purdue was ranked third as well. for a period After they won 19 in a row, right? You got yeah. Yeah. And, and I... Can't all when I do my research, which I never see the forest for the trees. I always look back too far. So, uh, anyway. I think Matt Painter started fourteen and 0 one year. Is that the, the most wins they've had out of the gate? Yeah, that year. Then Wisconsin beat them, and that was in two thousand nine ten. Is yeah. that right? But uh, yeah, so there's a lot of interesting things going on. You've got an interesting week in men's basketball to keep uh, not only Brian busy, but uh, the fan base busy because. You had a win. You got Florida State. Then you have the open of the Big Ten schedule on Friday night. Nine, was a nine o'clock start against Iowa. Always will get your attention. And heck, Katie Gerald's team went to Florida State and, and pulled a huge upset today. I don't think we, any of us thought, not that we cover women's basketball, but they beat a, what, a 16th or 17th ranked team today. That's an amazing story as well. And uh, that's uh, something that, uh, again, if, at least for the Purdue fan base, uh, Dave Shondell's volleyball team also doing well, so there's a lot to be lot to be excited about. All it right, seemed guys. Like after the football yeah. game, uh, everybody on the in the football program got their story straight about yeah. propping up all the other Purdue sports. That was an admirable thing, but clearly, yeah, I'm sure something where everybody kind of got their heads together before the press conference and said, "Hey, guys, this is a great opportunity for us to amplify some of Purdue's other success." That's yeah, a good that thing. Right. I, I just thought yeah. it was funny that everybody yeah. was on. Oh message. yeah, yeah, that's that has been a clear thing. Uh, from that standpoint, but uh, yeah, there's some truth to it. Again, it was, it was again. Brahms' opening statement, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Ain't no about, yeah. about volleyball, women's basketball, and men's yeah. basketball, and yeah, Aiden O'Connell had the same spiel when I talked to him. I, I think David. Well, Bell but you got to remember who Aiden O'Connell's girlfriend is, Jail Johnson, on the volleyball team. So I think David uh, Bell might have said reason. it too. Yeah, they got briefed by. Uh, yeah. Bob well, Bob. again, yeah, I, I'll tell you that. Uh, That's that fine. It it's is, just funny. It, it's oh, just, it is funny. It's it has been a it's big cute story. Line because, and they're putting it on uh, social media as well because they're all ranked and everybody feels good. So we're going to end this feel good podcast, simulcast uh, with that. And we will look forward to next week. I guess it'll be a we'll, we will be. And I'll have to look at that time wise in terms of what might be a good time to do it just because we won't find out to the bowl. We may wait till Sunday to do it just because yeah. of that, but we'll, we'll figure that out and we'll let you know, check local listings. All right, Brian and Tom, thanks so much for your time. Thank the union club hotel uh, for sponsoring as well. And we will look forward to seeing you next weekend uh, as there'll be a lot to talk about with, with Purdue football and basketball. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>